What's going on, good people of the internet? It's time for OnComicsGrounds.com flagship podcast, panel to panel, where a bunch of folks shoot the breeze and talk about comic books and such. We are back once again, once again, to talk all that good nerdy news and comic book goodness that we love talking about in this weird world we live in. Um, This is going to be a hard one for us, y'all. And, you want to be, be so excited, but then you stop and look and you cry a lot. Yeah, that's a great way to phrase and, and think to yourself, what the holy menstruation are we doing start here? This right now. You start early, Travis. Damn it. <laughs> what we mean is, to, uh, and to continue on with our LGBTQIA History Month, we are going to be talking about uh, one of, up until, up until a certain point, one of my favorite characters in comic books. And then they, they just sort of buried her to death, and now she's not, and it, it's just painful. Um, I am, of course, talking about uh, Miss America Chavez, one of the baddest females to ever set foot on a Marvel comic page, up until recently, where she's just been beaten to death with a wiffle ball bat. Um, but we're, we will get to that in a moment. Don't forget, folks, that you uh, listen, can listen to this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, <laughs> Stitcher Radio, Spotify, YouTube, uh, Amazon Music, um, Pandora, uh, basically anywhere you can listen to a podcast besides SoundCloud, you can find us. So please check us out. Um, I'm probably working on getting us, getting us on Facebook. Um, I'm having trouble deciding if we should have a panel to panel Facebook page or just have all three shows under the, the OCG Facebook page. But I, we will be doing some uh, consideration and getting us on Facebook soon, because apparently Facebook's hopping for podcasts right now. Um, so we will be looking into that soon. Um, but you can follow us on Twitter at PTP underscore podcast, where our social media Ian, uh, social media Ian, <laughs> social media manager Ian will love to talk to you guys about comic books and all that, all that good shit during the week when we are not recording. So, my name is James Portis. I'm excited, but also sad. Uh, we will be talking about that soon enough. But to my left, we have the man who um, started off the show in a very weird way. Um, he has the fro that seems to never stop growing. Um, he was yet again late to the podcast, but we love him dearly. Uh, Travis Tucker, how are you doing today? Uh, I'm trying to think of other ways to spin what I just said that's not going to sound weird. But there's no way to not do that, so I'm going to lean into it. Um... <laughs> I'm going to put, I'm gonna put my... I'm just gonna put my beer bottle to my temple and cry. Yeah, you oh. should. You should because we're about to sacred discharge all over this shit. Oh no! And <sighs> from the divine passage. <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh god! And to my right, we have the 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 only lesbian that i trust to talk about this what what of what we thought was the greatest of lesbians but now isn't as good as as she once was we have mary how you doing tonight honey took an delta a, a delta 8 edible and i have a jack and coke next to me so this is how it's going to go tonight Leave it. okay so and i already ate all my snacks in frustration so now i'm mad <laughs> All right, folks. So before we dive straight into it, um, I felt it appropriate before I make everybody sad with this topic, because while I love this girl to death, I don't feel like being that upset. And we're going to start like light before we go into the pain. Um, so to, to sort of lean into the fact that we, talk, we, we, we will be talking about Marvel news. Um, the big thing that's been sort of floating on my timeline the past, like, week and a half was the fact that Empire released some new stills about the upcoming Spider-Man, uh, No Way Home movie. Um, and originally when the trailer came out, our, um, One Sister podcast, Living on the Edge, a Spider-Man podcast, was still airing, so I was more than happy to let them cover all the Spider-Man news and whatnot, but honestly, 
I feel like uh, talking about this trailer because the trailer was nice a while back, and now that we got some stills and people are getting excited about the the soon to be arriving mess of a movie we we're about to get, um, I thought it'd be fun to talk about. And I, I gotta say, I, I've had my mixed feelings about the Tom Holland Spider Man. I've been back and forth on it. I, like one minute I love him, the next minute I hate him. Um, the, the, like the next minute, I'm just laughing at the fact that a freaking happy Hogan of all people is dating Aunt May. But um, that's that's whatever. Um, but no, from from the trailer that we got and the, and what Doctor Strange does, where he straight up breaks the multiverse for Peter, and then we have freaking Alfred Molina walk onto a bridge and just stroll up, say, "I'm back, bitches." I'm like, I, I gotta say, I'm excited for the prospect of what could be happening here, and. Now we're getting information like, oh, Jamie Foxx is going to be here. Uh, Willem Dafoe is going to be here. Maybe Sandman might be here. Oh, maybe the other two Spider-Men might be here. We don't fucking know. They can't figure out, like, what's going on. And they're keeping real tight-lipped about it. It'd be really fucking cool if this is, like, the best way to swing out. (laughs) Yeah, to swing out. But um, because Tom Holland has let loose that this will be his last Spider-Man entry. While he may play Spider-Man in the future for other pro- uh, projects, he will be doing this as his last Spider-Man movie. And I think this could be a great way to send off the character and a great way to be like, hey, Miles, you're up next, buddy, and just move on. But, um, Travis, I want to know how you feeling about, about what could be coming soon in our future. I don't know, man, because if I'm being totally honest with you, I feel like the MCU is getting to this point where they can literally do whatever the fuck they want and nobody cares. Um, We're getting an Eternals movie in a few weeks. Right, and we have no idea what that's going to be like. What do you mean they already ruined it? They... (sighs) They're from a distant planet, and they're a race of aliens, not an option. Like, not a different kind of homo sapien. It's, like, the one thing that, for me, made the Eternals really interesting was their the fact that the Eternals and the Deviants are very closely related to humans, much in the way that uh, the X-Men are. (laughs) Homo superior. Ladies and gentlemen, Mary is a fucking weeb. (laughs) <laughs> what the hell is that I, I guess it's more of a Jack Kirby thing because to be honest because it's a, um, it's a yes. very specific detail out of passion and love what because you ain't a weeb I mean I'm a weeb but like prior to the announcement for the film about six people were diehard Eternals fans Mm -hmm. Because the Eternals were created by Jack Kirby and they're pretty much just New Gods Jr. Yeah. That's really all the Eternals are, is just New Gods Jr. I mean, it's kind of like, you know, saying that you were a fan of the Challengers of the Unknown. Everyone's like, oh, okay, good for you. Like, what the fuck are the Eternals? So, like, it's somehow even more obscure than the Guardians. And like, I'm an Adam Strange fan. <laughs> my my thing about it is, you see like Angelina Jolie and Kumar Anjiani and like all these other motherfuckers being in this movie. And my thing about it is, why couldn't we get this kind of energy for the Inhumans? Because that's pretty <laughs> much like that's pretty much what they're really pitching here is the Inhumans, but we fucked that up, so we're doing it differently this time. And I'm just like... "Eh, It's because eh, eh, Marvel, the MCU, desperately wants to make something with the mutants, but it's still too soon. Yeah. So that's what the Inhumans, the TV show was supposed to be, is it was supposed to be, okay, look, we don't have the X-Men, so here are the Inhumans, we're going to pretend that they're super important, and we're going to have the comics, they're going to be super important. And, like, by all means, be a fan of the Eternals, but at that time, during All New, All Different, they were trying to institute the Inhumans as a substitute for the X-Men. Yeah, and like that 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 is some, that isn't something that we're fighting. Granted, I vehemently hate the Inhumans because of what Marvel did, and I will die on that hill. Ian, I'm sorry, you can you can hate me, I don't care. But in terms of what Her Marvel, his name is Medusa Lith. What the fuck? His name is Blackagar Boltagon. Like, what the fuck do you want from me? But like, originally the original pitch for See, I I like Lord Boltagon. 
Oh my god. Um, but no, like, in terms of the original pitch, people were like, yo, they're gonna be an Inhumans movie, Vin Diesel might play Black Bull, we're gonna do all this slick shit, and then it was like, okay, now they're just on TV. And it's like, what the fuck? And then it's like, oh, then we got the, the guy who made the Iron Fist show to direct it. Oh, now, now you're just getting worse. Oh, and then we shaved off Medusa's head in the first episode. The fuck? Like, Literally, not- her whole personality is just the hair. And not only that, you got one of my favorite actresses to play her because of how talented she is. And then you just said, you know what? Fuck you. Like, it, the entire show pretty much was just, how do we make low-budget X-Men with no budget? And it's like, yeah, we'll fuck over all these amazing actors like Saranda Swan and the dude who played, uh, uh, like, actually, no, that, that is the same guy. I thought it was the same guy who played Bishop in uh, X-Men uh, Apocalypse. But, like, we know, uh, what was his name? Uh, Ewan of uh, Rion, I think his name is. Because he acted in Game of Thrones is really fucking good. You, you like, we all know Serena Swan's a fucking You're beast. You missed it, too, if you ever watched that. <laughs> oh, I, I have not. Um, and, like, freaking Anson <laughs> Mount fucking walked in to play a Black Bull. And we know Anson Mount is a good fucking actor. And it's just, like, this show was just doomed from the start. So, but it's like, if you would have put the energy out in the universe to make Inhumans be your X-Men at the time, and not just said, let's put them on TV, imagine how that could have just been your Eternals. And now you're trying to make in, like Eternal, like, like, like Inhumans the Eternals, and it's just not working for me. Like, they even got them on Earth, and like... The the one the one they randomly changed to a gay black man is out here like with a husband and shit on Earth with kids. Which good for you that representation that we needed a long time ago you're finally doing. But like it's a little late. But is just, anyone else like super underwhelmed with that change? Honestly, th- there's there's no gay change that could satisfy me ever since I saw Joe Russo sit in a chair at a at a discount AA meeting and act like he was a, he was a gay guy, and I was just like, "Excuse me, gay Joe Russo is a queer icon." Fuck you. <laughs> Wait, like, hold on. Am I missing something? Oh, so in the you, very you, beginning it, of Endgame, there's that support group. Mm-hmm. And yeah, no, one, I remember. But I, I thought that he had actually come out, or was this no, like not no, a thing? No, no, Russo no. straight up just walked on set, acted like he was some like some super depressed gay man, and just did that. He's not gay. Oh, so okay. So then, um. That scene kind of doesn't mean shit anymore to me. That's exactly. Awesome. <laughs> it literally was so bad. I remember when it came out and Mary and I kind of just like looked at each other like, what the fuck is this? Like, I remember I literally like was crying about Sam like in, like from watching it. And I called Mary and I'm just like, yo, I'm fucking emotional. But like, fuck Joe Russo. And she was like, yep. <laughs> so it's just like... No, nah, when it comes to Marvel's gay representation, they lack it. And in terms of like, yeah, Marvel can really do no James, wrong. James, sweetheart, lack is not strong enough of a word. That's valid. Do you know what singular Deficient. Marvel property has the most queer representation in it? X-Men. Fucking Runaways. I'm oh, talking like away. MCU properties. Oh, yeah, Runaways. And, it's, and Runaways possibly isn't even canon anymore. <laughs> yeah. They said, we're going to shove this bitch all the way to California and just act like it's not canon. <laughs> because, like, like, Fox and Disney, they looked at New Mutants and Runaways and went, you know what? Let's just make Mary really sad. These are her <laughs> two favorite Marvel properties. Like, the two she loves in this entire, you know, franchise. But we're just going to try to make her unhappy. Like, who did I make angry? We had to get Mary high to watch New Mutants, y'all. Like, just put that into, into, into perspective. But anyway, um, so no, to, for, to back to Travis's point, you know, like, Marvel can't really do wrong, for crying out loud. Uh, spoilers for, like, a movie that's been out for a month. Um, if you didn't watch the um, Ve- uh, the Venom Let There Be Carnage end credit scene, um, Venom's coming to the MCU one way or another, and I'm not really thrilled about it. To live in a world that where... It's not the same, it's not the right tone, you know what I mean? Yeah, like, and the idea of Tom Hardy being in the MCU just makes me feel gross. Yeah. You could say. And on that same hand, like, I just... Get it, babe. Wow. (laughs) 
Like, no, I might need to like do a panel to panel episode about that. How much I hate Dark Knight Rises. That might need to be a thing. Like, I vehemently hate the Dark Knight Yo. Rises. And if I could smack Christopher Nolan with a white glove and make him understand why he's a failure for that movie, it would literally make my life so much better. I kind of half want to hear you rant about that right now. <laughs> we don't have the time. <laughs> <laughs> we'll say this about The Dark Knight Rises is that Anne Hathaway gave it everything she had. Though. Anne Hathaway is the only, like, Anne Hathaway and Joseph Gordon Levin's bitch of a character are the only reason why that movie isn't a failure. Like, literally. Joseph Gordon Levin's fucking Robin. <laughs> Don't talk about it. But, like, li- like literally, if it weren't for the fact that Joseph Gordon Levin is a great actor I and Anne Hathaway busted her ass for that movie, I would burn it to the ground. It was like, yo, let's just ruin the Batman as a character and just write Morgan Freeman a check for showing up. And it's just like, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> like, like let, let's, let's make Bane nothing like he's supposed to be in the comics. Um, let's we'll make it a white guy with a weird breathing apparatus who has no th- nothing like like in, the, in the terms of venom whatsoever, <laughs> and he's just well, a really buff say, ass buff guy. I will say this: Tom Hardy did very well with what he was given. Sadly, yes. Like, if we just look at you know the script itself, Bane strictly within the context of the script, he did very well with the material he was given. Right. Am I happy about it? No, but I'm not happy. You're in charge. <laughs> like the the only the, the only good from that came from a South Park meme where everyone had the Bane mask and they tried to kill the UPS man. Like that's the only good thing that ever came from that fucking movie. Anyway, we've had our little bit of, of fun, like like uh, like talking about Marvel stuff. Let's be depressed and talk about Marvel stuff. So, who? And, and like in the spirit of LGBTQIA plus history month, it, it felt only Here's right. Here's the history lesson on what not to do. Yeah. And like I wanted to do a Marvel character. I didn't want to be basic and do Wiccan and Hulkling. I didn't want to just like give a Mary like a repeat of her one of Runaways episode. I wanted to give justice to a character that deserves it. But at the same time, the injustice that has happened to her over the past few years has just been appalling. So, I oh, I felt the need to do this episode, and Mary obliged me, despite kicking and screaming, that she would go through the history of America Chavez as a character and give us something to talk about. So, Mary made me depressed. Okay. Well, I just got a notification that my battery is dying. Let me check my charger. James, vamp for a minute. Okay, give me a moment. Um, I can do that. That's fine. So, America Chavez, um, known by her moniker, uh, her moniker, Miss America, was created in Vengeance Number One in 2000, 2011. And that book is something we'll get to in a minute once Mary fixes what she's got going on. But in terms of America as a character, she came out swinging as somebody who didn't deal with nobody's shit. She came out as someone that could be a powerhouse of a, of, of a superhero in the uh, in the Marvel landscape. She came onto the scene more prominently in the the sort of continuation of the Young Avengers. Now with um, Eli Bradley no longer on the team, now going through sort of a reboot, as it were, and now with like things having progressed where she joined the Ultimates and then she be, be sort of just kind of like disappeared from existence because her her solo book bombed and then we gave her another solo book and that bombed. And it's just like, what, what, are you, what are you? Anyway. Okay, I'm here. Mary, make me more depressed than I already am. Sorry, my charger came unplugged and I hadn't noticed. My computer's like, hey, we're gonna fucking die. No, that's cool. I, I think I gave a pretty good intro so far. Okay, so America Chavez, as a character, first appeared with the Teen Brigade in Vengeance Number One. Vengeance is a thoroughly depressing book written by. A literal shitstorm of a human being. Um, Joe Casey, if you're curious. Just just don't. I, I have one thing. to. S- I mean, vengeance is... Honestly, and I'm not, like, trying to be funny or cute when I say this, but it's just a really shitty book. Like, and I try not to go swinging too hard on the show. You know, just for the sake of, you know, respect to the creators kind of a thing. But nah, this is a shitty book. Like for, for point of reference, Joe Casey is known for also writing things like Young Blood for um what's his face, so good job. 
And he honestly just seems like a genuinely unpleasant human being. Fucking stupid ass handlebar mustache. Anyway, um, she appears with the Team Brigade. And her character in the book is pretty much just, I'm a girl and I punch things. You know, she's America by, you know, initial meeting. She's very caustic. She's very gruff. Um, and she kind of has a bit of a miniature romance with the ultimate nullifier, who is another character on the team brigade. It's basically just a kiss and some benign flirting, but we'll address that in a moment. But the one thing, and they said this in a post book interview, but the one thing the creative team really wants you to take away from America Chavez and Vengeance, where she's about uh, 15 or so, is that she doesn't wear underwear. Oh. Uh, I sh- I, I sh- what? Oh, yeah. Uh, The the team did an interview, and one of them said that a very important part of her character is the fact that she doesn't wear underwear. How is that important at all? I don't know. I I don't know, Travis. I really don't know. (laughs) These questions are for the void. (laughs) So, from there... And that's really all I'm going to touch on with Vengeance, because it's it's a villain's event. It's inconsequential. The Teed Brigade is there to just kind of be a teen team. And it's a six-issue mini. I'm sure um, number one will shoot up in value when Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness come out. Probably. Um, to which I am looking forward to, because this jackass bought all six issues of Vengeance when it was coming out, because she thought it was like, ooh, here's Magneto, you love Magneto, why, Mary, why? <laughs> I believe, ironically, in 2011, I think my initial reaction to America Chavez was literally, who the fuck is this? Like... <laughs> oh, you know. So, I have Vengeance number one, so... I want to be able to flex on people, so if the value could shoot up, I would really appreciate that. That's how I feel about my five issues of all new Captain America that I'm sitting on for when Captain America 4 comes out. So, from here, um, she doesn't do much. We don't see her until um, Young Avengers Volume 2. Uh, Volume 2 was released in, what, 2014, I want to say, right? Um, do to do I believe so. Because I've got the singles for that stuffed in a box somewhere. Because it was after Eli left the team, and they were going through like a redesign. Um, I believe so. Yeah, I think they're just twenty twenty fourteen. Yeah, yeah. Because um, Karen, Karen going got the um the um it might have actually been two thousand six. No, yes, 20, 20, 2014, 2014. I was right. And, you know, um, people rate Young Avengers Volume 2, which was, I believe, a 14-issue book, Mm -hmm. um, rate it as, for, like, a single volume look, rate it as high as the first eight, the first volume of Runaways, or, you know, um, God, what's that one Daredevil run, the one that I don't care about? There's, there's several Daredevil runs you don't care about, Mary. Uh, pretty much all of them, actually. But it Why is... do I want to say Man Without Fear? Yes, there's... that's the one. But, I mean, it's a very highly regarded book in not only comic books, but in the Marvel fandom. And it is well-earned. It's a damn good book. Yeah. Even though I miss Eli. Yes, but... The first volume was good, damn it. I mean, don't get me wrong, the first volume was good. Alan Heinberg knows what he's doing. Mm-hmm. But, you know, you have Jamie McKelvey and Kieran Gillen teaming up. I mean, their combination is incredible. I'm just saying Kid Loki was a dumb idea. That's all I'm saying. Oh, I do agree with you, but four words, the wicked and the divine. Yeah. Also, uh, Gillen and McKelvey, and it's an image book. You should check it out. But, um... We see America reintroduced, and the first thing you notice is, wait, wasn't she in this book? This other book? And also, she looks a hell of a lot different. Yes, she does. In uh, Vengeance, she's basically wearing a tiny little little jean jacket, a crop top, and low-rise leggings. Like... And here we... And here we see her, um... 
much more symmetrically dressed. Like her outfits don't look like garbage. Remember, I am inebriated. Mm. So um, this won't be my most eloquent lecture ever given. This is, this is less of a lecture and more of a, of, of a freaking wake. <laughs> but um, America quickly becomes uh, central to the plot in uh, Young Avengers because she runs afoul of Kid Loki who tries to convince her to kill Wiccan, a.k.a. Billy Kaplan, a.k.a. the Space Emperor's husband. A.k.a. Uh, Wanda Maximoff's child. Well, depending upon who you ask, apparently. Let's not talk about fucking <laughs> Axis. Are you sure? I don't want to talk about Axis. <laughs> but, um... What the kid, rest Axis at some point? Kid Loki is, well, being... Um, being Loki. Um, and tries to get America Chavez to kill Wiccan for her. For him. And America's just kind of, you know, she's rather disgusted with the idea, so she decides to protect Billy instead. So this is how we see her team up with the Young Avengers. And, you know, there are various shenanigans. And there is, in the book, there's a villain named Mother, who, you know, the Young Avengers is pretty much just like the Dead Parent Society. Uh, <clears throat> I mean... What? Uh, in true teen team fashion, there are a lot of dead parents of the various characters of the Young Avengers. Yeah. Because for whatever reason, teenage superheroes cannot have living parents. It would just be a mockery. Having parents means you don't do stupid things. That's, <laughs> that's how it goes. <laughs> My teenage years would like to have a word. <laughs> right. <laughs> but um and during the altercation with uh mother where she sort of I'm not going to get into it where she sort of resurrects the dead parents and makes the young avengers fight them. And this is where we really get our first look, in-depth look into America's past is that um she has to fight her superpowered mothers. And a thing about America's powers is we kind of need to outline those because she is accused of being overpowered a lot. And to a sense, she is. She um, has physical she strength. Busted. She has phys um, super strength and she can fly and she's super durable. The way I've kind of measured it in the comics is that she's pretty on par with Supergirl in terms of physical strength and ability. So if you think about her power set, think about Supergirl. Like, you know, that immense Kryptonian strength, the super... I don't think she has super speed. No, she does not. America doesn't have super speed, but she fly. You know, so think about it within that context. Like, okay, it's basically just Supergirl's powers. But the more important of the powers is that she can create star portals, which will go to different universes. Or even just different places in the same universe as well. In the regular 616 universe. So America Chavez can actually pass between dimensions like a damn portal gun. There's a dated reference if you ever wanted one. Early 2000s. Hey, por Portal's a good game, though. It's a good game. It's, it's a fantastic game with absolutely no replay value. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> but, um... So we see her, uh, our first in-depth look at her past. And really Young Avengers Volume 2, it has the superhero side of it. And then it's kind of slowly examining America Chavez's backstory. Where, yes, she was in six issues of Vengeance written by Joe Casey. Kieran Gillen is rightfully so, largely given credit for developing the character. That, you know, it took, like, her base-level attitude from Vengeance, but gave it actual character depth. So, um... And towards the end of Young Avengers, and I don't want to try and spoil the entire book, because it's really one you should read for yourself. But Billy is directly involved with an event called the Demurge. And... Through that event, and I'm like I said, I'm not going to go into depth with this, 
it leads to the creation of something called the utopian parallel. And the way I understand it is that it's basically a universe that exists without outside the realms of the Marvel universe, like the entire comic universe and those alternate realities within the utopian parallel is outside of that. So the way I kind of like to describe it to Victoria sometimes is that I think it's the wall between the DC and the Marvel universes, if that makes sense. That is make that sense. It exists with outside the realms of those other universes, which means that America cannot go back to the utopian parallel. There's a tear in the galactic sky hole thingy that threatens to destroy it. And America's parents use their powers to essentially stop that from happening, but they are completely obliterated in the process. I believe the uh, line America uses is something similar to the effect of, you know, my mothers are smeared across the galaxy. Mm. But America, who was a child waiting for her moms to come back, gets the news that... that they've died. And so she takes off through the closing portal. And on the other side of that portal, tear in the time-space continuum thingy, is the Marvel Universe. And America ends up there. So, <coughs> excuse me. Her parents are dead. She pops up on the other side of the wall. And she's stuck there. She can't go back to the Utopian Parallel. And honestly, even if she'd want to. She experiences bits and pieces of it, but she is shut off from the whole thing. There are additions to that later on. You know how, um, I believe it's in Trek, he describes his personality like an onion. Yep. (laughs) That's America's story, is that it's like an onion. There are a lot of layers. But the further you go into that onion, the more diseased and rotten it becomes. Because we got a lot of shitty, we got a lot of shitty material to get through here. But so yes, and if you're saying, well, wait, didn't Billy create the demurge that led to the utopian yada yada yada? And like, does that mean he created America? And in a sense, you're right. <laughs> so um, let me scroll down my outline here. Um, basically one of the big reasons why she left is that she wanted to prove herself a hero like her parent. That, you know, the she's some age between six and ten, I don't really remember. But she cra- she's traveled across distant realities as a child. And she eventually um, takes the moniker of Miss, uh, Miss America. Not Miss, but Ms. So, kind of. And Miss America, I believe she is a long-standing Marvel character. Uh-huh. But so you could look at it of America is just the latest um, of the people to have that name, but it's it's thrown off by her given name, which is also America. Okay, so that kind of gets us through um, where she's at in Young Avengers. Like I said, I don't really want to give too much away. So from here. We see she she pops up a little bit here and there. She was a central character in the side books for Secret Wars, if that makes any sense. Mm. Is that we um she appears in more than one and is is in the main cast, so that's what I meant. Also gives me cancer. Also intoxicants. <laughs> But uh, she starts out in A-Force, in the, <sighs> in the Secret Wars tie-in book in A-Force. So we see her there, and then she moves to the S.H.I.E.L.D. Most importantly, the thing you have to think about with the S.H.I.E.L.D. is that this is also written by Kieran, Kieran Gillen. Yep. So we're seeing, the, we're seeing kind of the, what I like to call the Rucka effect in place right now. Where a character is considered really good in material that's, you know, when she's written by the same person. I like to call it the Greg Rucka effect because if you look at Greg Rucka and characters like Batwoman and to a lesser extent Wonder Woman, it, that, you know, people really only like the character when this person is writing the book and that character's worth is only linked to that person, if that makes any sense. Definitely. And so I just, I like to call it the Rucka effect because I, I like Greg Rucka a lot. Greg Rucka is really awesome. 
But um, so we see that Gillen's kind of not letting go of the character. Um, I don't. I think Civil War Two comes before the solo book. But um, after uh, the Secret Wars event ends, um, the universe kind of snaps back to normal. And America kind of pops up here and there for a little bit, ultimately, <laughs> ultimately uh-huh. join- joining the Ultimates uh, later on, around the time of Secret Wars 2. And America actually is directly involved in the intergroup conflict of of the Ultimates in Secret Wars 2. Basically, she's the instigator. She throws a chair at Captain Marvel, and it's really funny that two, I would say, close to Kryptonian class, physical strength having heroes resort to throwing chairs. It's just very funny. America is easily one of the most powerful characters in the Marvel Universe. Not that writers do anything with that. Hmm. But... Her presence on the Ultimates, I'd say Al Ewing did fantastic things with her character. And I think this is a place where we can dive a bit more into substance. Um, I just don't really like to spoil Young Avengers for anybody. Which is very fair. Because it has a very good singular story. Even uh, I've noticed that even minis can get sidetracked by a subplot that's going on. But, you know, Young Avengers is just a very strong narrative start to finish. Hmm. But um, I feel like I'm making no sense and you guys are just going, uh. To no, me- honestly, you're making a lot of sense. Sorry, I was skimming the Made in, Made in America book real quick and I, I hate everything and I'm so angry. It's not even funny. Oh, I'm trying yeah. to find where you are in the notes while also listening because I know nothing about America at all. Oh, Travis, <laughs> you're, you're, you're missing out because honestly Young, honestly, Young Avengers is a really freaking good book. It, like, and it, you- it, yeah. You don't actually need a lot of pre-existing Young Avengers knowledge to get into it. That's why a lot of people like from the, like, that teen era that are sort of our age now loved it, which because if you didn't read um, the, the, the first volume while you still could enjoy it, you started to fall in love with characters like um, America, like, Bill, uh, Billy, like, like Billy and like Kate specifically. Now that Kate's very popular, that's where a lot of Kate's fan base came from. And oh, so- yeah. So it's like, not only did she start out in volume one, but the majority of her fan base started to rise even higher with, uh, like, with the, the second volume. I'd honestly say that Fraction's Hawkeye ended up just supplementing the popularity that Kate got from mm-hmm. Young Avengers. Most definitely. And like, here's the thing. I think Kate's best thing was the, the first volume because I still say her best line ever in the history of everything was when she straight cussed out Clinton Barton after the death of Captain America for being a dickhole and putting on the Captain America costume. So like, if you ever want to just be depressed but also see Kate Bishop be a badass, just read Jeff Loeb's Fallen Son, Death of Captain America, and it's the funniest shit you'll ever read. So comic book Clinton Barton Hawkeye is to be protected at all costs, and MCU Clint. Barton can just find a hole and die. Unless he's being a dick. That's the only other time we, we, we don't stand uh, comic book Hawkeye. Like, Secret, like Secret Empire Clint, who was just a dick. The- Ironically, James bringing up Kate Bishop is that I'll take this chance um, while you boys are kind of catching up to vamp a little bit on what I what is affectionately called America-Kate. America-Kate! America-Kate, yes. America Chavez and Kate Bishop are... Um, they develop a really deep, very genuine friendship in the pages of Young Avengers, culminating, I'm calling her princess, culminating to my favorite moment in the end of the book. Uh, there's a lot of queer stuff happening in the book. And at the end, uh, Kate Bishop kind of, you know, makes a huffy noise and says, so you're telling me I'm the only straight person on this team. And America opens a portal and she's punching it open and she turns over her shoulder and she says, I've seen the way you look at me, princess. You're not that straight. And it is the best line in the whole book. But that kind of sparked a growing ship between the two of them is that um, honestly, it'd be really cute and I love it. And everyone's just kind of going, come on already. It was supposed to happen, damn it. Um... (sighs) Ironically, this is um, where my issues come in, is that Marvel is actually typically pretty good, at least in the comics, 
of responding to fanships and at least poking at it a bit. So, you know, a lot of us were kind of expecting to see that with Kate in America. Um, several writers have determined that they are to be besties and nothing more. Why? And this is where I kind of start to... I love this writer very dearly. But um, there are issues that I have, and I think that's fair. You know, this is a critique of the writing, a good, what I consider a good faith critique. Uh, but Kelly Thompson. I know, I know, hold your shock, please. She's a very popular writer. A lot of people love her. She's worked a lot with Kate Bishop, writing some damn good Kate Bishop books. Yes. And a uh, okay young, uh, okay West Coast Avengers book. Uh, I, I will be very critical of her West Coast Avengers book. But like. See, it, it gave me like, like, um, Tigress kaiju monster, and I never knew I wanted that. That's fair. But, like, I, I think Kelly Thompson's at her best when someone just says, make good wo- woman character do good woman shit. And, but, like, she, th- and this is my biggest critique of Kelly Thompson. Please, for the love of God, learn how to create a status quo with a character. Please. <laughs> Please. Carol has had, what, 30, 40, 30, 40 issues now, and she still doesn't have a status quo? Please, 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 please. Like, and, e- even her, in her Kate book, it's just like, it doesn't slow down. I, I like, 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 I love her writing. I love her action scenes. I love how, like, her quips. I love that she gives everybody a soul when she writes them. But please, like, slow down. Please give us a status quo, please. That's all I ask. There's my pain moment for a moment. Kelly Thompson, and now granted, this is pure speculation on my part, just from what I have pulled from the narrative. I don't know Kelly Thompson. I don't claim to know Kelly Thompson. So this is not, this is just what I infer from her narrative. Is that she firmly seems to be in the camp of Kate Bishop is not queer. Not, obviously, there's nothing wrong with a straight character. And it's not done from a place of maliciousness. That's very clear in the narrative. Um, but it's just, I kind of get the feeling that Thompson, you know, is just kind of sitting here thinking, okay, I just don't think Kate is queer. Like, I don't think she's bi. I don't think she's getting nothing like that. I just, I don't think she's queer. And I'm not going to write her from that perspective. So there is nothing malicious. Kelly Thompson includes a lot of LGBTQ identities into her book. Well, and in this one, you missed the mark, really, She really shouldn't be allowed to. Like, I, don't, I don't like the way she writes queer characters. And this does extend to America as well. Because it might just, you know, behoove us right now to kind of talk about the group books a bit before we continue with her solo story. Al Ewing is a god! That's all I'm going to say. Ultimates is a damn good book. When there will come a time soon, after we get through PTP versus the New 52, where we will talk about Ultimates. I swear to you. I'm going to give Travis a few episodes to do his thing, because he really wants to do his thing, and then we're doing Al Ewing Month. Not Al Ewing Month. No, well, maybe Al Ewing Month. Al Ewing Month could be fun. But, like, at the very least, we're doing uh, Ultimates, because I need to talk about Ultimates. <laughs> But that is a book where America is very central. I mean, she's actually kind of like during the post Civil War, that that Civil War II era, you know, we were actually seeing America kind of rise in prominence. She became a leader of the team. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, she does some cool shit like Monica Rambeau's coming at her and America turns and looks at her and opens a star portal in her eye, teleporting Monica to the other side of the universe. Like, those are some dope-ass power displays from America. And And honestly, like, that was a distance that Monica would be annoyed about traveling, but she could travel to the other side of the universe very quickly. She travels at the like she literally is the embodiment of light energy. She can go there pretty fast. But um You know, so we see that is a very strong entry, and Ewing does really take his time to form a really beautiful relationship between America and a young paramedic whose name escapes me at the moment. That's mm-hmm. how important she is. She's but, there for like five minutes. 
Yeah. And the fact that, you know, we do see them kind of uh, struggle with their relationship a little bit because Ewing is able to successfully balance professional life. I'm using air quotes here for superheroes, but also their personal lives. So we get to see injections of that in the book, but they don't disrupt it. So that's one reason why I think giving America a bit of a personal life in this book works really well is that it slowly adds the little elements to her like her idiosyncrasies in a relationship you know the way she talks to a partner so i i took the edible at the start of the show and i think it's starting to kick in and the jack Daniels is like <laughs> let's have a party well it's good uh, it's a good thing we're almost to the rant portion of the show yeah pretty much because i feel like i have lost any comprehensive travis how do you do this all the time uh with experience <laughs> You get used to it. You know, it, just take note of how much like Gandalf smokes in Lord of the Rings. You have to smoke like that much to get used to it. <laughs> oh, no, thank you. But um, and then we kind of uh, we don't kind of, but then we see America move to West Coast Avengers. Which... No, 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 no. You don't get to just sidetrack like that, lady. No, Wait, no. what? You don't get to you don't get to just take a big a skip over the over the pain. No 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 no. There's pain. You don't no no. Backtrack, rewind. There's James, a big you just missed a big gap. I am legitimately confused. Gabby's book comes before West Coast. I said a few minutes ago that I felt this was a good point to like look at the team books before oh, we right, progress. Right, right. Sorry, sorry. I was like, wait a minute, we need to discuss pain, but go ahead, go ahead, sorry. No, 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 we will, we're not going to skip the pan. I just feel like it's easier to, because the most of the material in her side books don't affect her solo material at that's all. That's valid. Oh, okay, yeah, go for it. We'll get there. So she just, she's had a couple different girlfriends between now and then, but that's about it. Mm -hmm. But um, Kate moved to, Kate Bishop moved to California to um, essentially be a private detective. And that goes about as well as you could imagine. But um, through various shenanigans and shenaniganery, um, we see a bunch of her friends move out that way, too. And she forms a new version of the West Coast Avengers, you know, an obvious nod to the actual West Coast Avengers. Well, the original, not the actual, where Hawkeye kind of said, fuck y'all, I'm out. And it's like, now this, this other Hawkeye is saying, fuck y'all, I'm out. Yeah, so it's a fun nod to that. And it's a pretty basic team book. Like, there's a a very bizarre threat, you know. I remember the villain is, like, some super hunky surfer guy as opposed to, like, a traditional, like, I, I don't know. It's difficult to explain. I actually also haven't read it in a while. It's, yeah, it's been a hot minute since that book came out. But this is where um, my disappointment with Kelly Thompson writing America Chavez really comes in and so far you know Gillen is considered to be her central right like that is the writer that developed her he's and, more of a creator th than joe casey is let's put it that uh, way yeah yeah and huh. um i actually lost my train of thought Kelly completely Tom. Sorry, so I've I've had addiction issues in the past, so any kind of a t intox can't like punches me in the face. Kelly Thompson writing uh, America. Yes, is that Thompson has this really horrible habit of writing queer characters as two dimensional. That um, well, technically they are two dimensional, but no and to, and to, and, uh, i see what you did there very close get it yeah <laughs> dork but she strips out a lot of the humanizing factors and kind of like look at this queer character they have no you know obvious downsides or anything and look how cute they are with their romance and so it's essentially it kind of falls under the category of like the gay best friend trope it's very much a Fear tactic that seems to, 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 to permeate writing in comic books where you don't want to upset the queer community, so you choose to make the queer character perfect so to, uh, to not uh, be given to potential backlash. 
And that's a whole trope all its own. Yeah. But, so, America, unfortunately, she doesn't get a lot of personal development. She does get a girlfriend that she promptly dumps at the end of Made in America. But, you know, she gets a girlfriend and, you know, it's a side character that Thompson created for the book. And a lot of frustrated queer readers like me of can Kate and America just kiss already? Because their relationship is very ribbing and good natured and a little flirty. And that's kind of the joke because they're both flirty characters. Mm -hmm. But we do see a lot of that stripped out at this point. And I'm just a salty shipper. But um, so any America things are said in jest. But um, my critiques of the way Thompson writes queer characters. Um, th that's just a whole separate thing on its own. And my, essentially what I'm trying to say is that, you know, there's not a lot of America growth here aside from the new girlfriend. And it's Ugh. just, really, it, it's really disappointing because she's been a bombastic character up until this point, And then we kind of see her just placed off to the side in the sidekick box. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, but that, that's really all that can be said about West Coast Avengers, and it's why I just kind of jumped to it right away, is that most of the team books, the side books, uh, tend to just be really inconsequential. Except for Ultimus, because Al Ewing is a god. Yeah, I, I just mean inconsequential to her central narrative. Okay, fair. Because, you know, every so often, uh, you know, there'll be something that happens in, like, a Justice League title that, you know, affects the mainline title, too. So that's mm -hmm. just kind of the rubric I'm, ju I'm judging this on. That's fair. But that more or less sums the base outline of her time as a team player in, you know, multi-teamed book. I'm sorry. But um, we do see, I want to say it was, what, 2017, where America Chavez got to become Marvel's first, you know, Latina superhero in a solo, in a solo book, where America number one comes out. And I got so many festive variants for that book, half priced about three years after it released. But um, it, it's a big deal that America was being given a solo book. It's something that fans had called for um, for a long time. Yep. And um, the expectations oh. and the hopes for this book were very high. And, you know, Marvel tapped a young adult novelist, Gabby Rivera, to, ha to write the book. And Rivera herself is a queer Latina woman. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it was kind of, you know, we were pumped and ready. And America very, very quickly became a very popular character. She's a fan favorite. And so the hype train is going and then just hits the side of the Titanic. So... Before that, America continues, I, 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 want to, I want to preface this. When America Chavez number one came out, there was, we were in knee deep in the landscape beginning with Comics Gate. As we know, Comics Gate is the horrible group that chooses to exist, trying to basically be the force that decides what can be diverse in the comic book and nerd landscape. And we have vehemently fought against this, whether it be from different YouTubers or from the idiocy that is um, Ethan Van Skyver. We have fought against that. But this is not a case of us siding with them. This is us offering a critique to a writer that very much did not handle a character correctly. Because at the time, this was a situation where this character, you either needed to jump on board or you were considered a gatekeeper. And that was a very hard time because this book just wasn't good. And it was very hard to offer a critique when we're being blasted from the other side of the, of the realm where no one really wanted America to have her own book. They, they really fought against it in the same wave of what they considered to be this bad version of Marvel that was too diverse. So when we're going about this, and I, I felt the need to preface this, when we're, when we're actually trying to offer critique here, we are not saying Gabby Rivera should not like write comics. I've heard her work at Boom is very, is very good. I have not read it. But for a first outing, this wasn't hot. So let's get into it. Hey, and this is where my inebriation will come in handy. Is that America, also titled The Life and Times of America Chavez, 
Um, sees America leaving the ultimate. And let me open my notes back up here. And going to college. You know, um, America leaves the Ultimates and goes to college. Uh, She breaks up with the girlfriend that she had at the end of Ultimates because she wouldn't follow America to college. So, you know, I I find that to be the most un-lesbian thing I've ever read because we are experts at (laughs) long-distance relationships. We are experts at it. (laughs) <laughs> like a, a, a two thousand mile drive, that's a brisk walk for us. <laughs> so, th- th- that's my first thing of the book. <laughs> We're but, off to a great start. But um, we see America going to college, and uh, it's a university out in space. It's a very prestigious university, and it's. Uh, Soto My- uh, yeah, Sotomayor University, or something of that nature, named after Supreme Court Justice Sonia Sotomayor, who was the first uh, Latina woman to be named to the Supreme Court. And personally, of uh, like one of my actual favorite Supreme Court justices, I like it when she writes her dissenting opinions. That's just the uh, poli sci major in me coming out. But yes, the Space University is named after Sonia Sotomayor, which typically, you know, isn't a problem in comics. Usually, yeah, I mean, usually there's a narrative attached to the name that, you know, it kind of goes along with the plot of the book. And this sort of does because it does take a very political tone later on. But. It just reads very cringy. Like, it's a bit too obvious of a nod, you know? There's just something about the execution that just doesn't make it work. And the narrative for this book is also very... I guess I just want to say basic. It's a little too stereotyped. It's a little too stylized. So that's kind of where I'm already starting with this book. And it just gets even worse because then she time travels and goes back to the early 1940s after America was involved in World War II. And James, can you take this one? Because I just, I need to save save my strength. So issue one has her going to the college and then in the midst of the college party that she goes to she falls through one of her own portals and ends up in the middle of the the world war ii battlefield next to captain america steve rogers and at the same time as we were supposed to get that iconic oh my but that captain america number one picture of steve punching hitler in the face she pushes steve out of the way and punches hitler herself and I feel like Mary will speak on this to a certain extent. Obviously, while I am a avid fan of the, the of men, I am not a, fe- a I am not a woman. I can't speak for the the ad perspective. But I don't think our, our, the main goal was to upstand Steve Rogers and punch Hitler yourselves. So. Yeah. Ugh. <sighs> okay. Like, come on, like, 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 can you vouch for that, please? I, I, I can't. Because, again, it's not an homage. It, it's just kind of, it, it's not like a she does it too. It's she physically throws him out of the way. And so, again, th- this will become a recurring theme in the book of the context makes the execution not work. That, you know, it's a really cool concept, but it's poor, it, it's ho- horribly executed. And this is one of those cases where, like, you know, it's it's a fun picture. Like, it would be a fun piece of fan art if somebody just had America punching Hitler because we know it's an homage to that moment. Mm-hmm. And it almost feels malicious in the way that it's done. And I I feel like... Well, yes, that might be a bit dramatic of a term. I just, there's something about the scene that doesn't sit right. And that's a moment that got 
that garnered more than mixed reaction from all sides of the fandom. Where it's oh, just yeah. it's just kind of like, why did you do this? Sorry, I was taking a drink. Oh, you're good. And and like before we rip on this book anymore. I feel like I sh- I I like cuz I I sat down today and I watched um Gabby Rivera's TED Talk she did where she talked about how she was so excited about this book that she wanted to give a voice to a character that had never had a queer uh, Latina voice before. And she talked about how she grew up in the Bronx and had and had her family to look up to because there was no Spanish superhero she could look up to. And I'm going to be 100% real with you. I identify with that so much. I identify with that so much because coming up, seeing a pool of freaking white people on the, the center stage in terms of comics and wanting to put your own out there, I feel it. I really do. To, the, to this day, like as y'all heard me a couple weeks ago when I came to the Jackson book, I was over the moon excited about finally having a black queer man lead a comic like that. I waited my entire life for that. But then what, when, what really bothers me about this book is the fact that you took America who was eight, like in... I'm 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 not gonna, I'm not gonna say what I what, what I was gonna say, but in terms of this this book, it really felt like she approached this more from a fan perspective than what needed to be done for the sake of the character. And it's like you you, you while while there is times where some writers can do that, like Scott Snyder is very infamous for that for treating Batman like like a fanboy, but there's a way to do it, and I and this book. It's it's painful. It sucks. And I really want to see America done well. And she's two for she's two for zero. Well, zero for two in terms of how she's been done. And it breaks my heart. So like when we critique this, it's not shots at Gabby as a person. Her intentions were so fucking awesome. But god damn this book. Yeah. And I think James really gives the sentiments that we're that I, I'm also trying to get to um, gives it gives it weight. The, this is not meant to be a personal attack or a personal critique. Um, we feel the need to go out of our way to mention this because at the time, given the charged nature within comics, a lot of hits against this book also went very personal. Which, be- like, ironically, believe it or not, isn't really the norm in comic books. Where, you know, if a person writes a bad book, you know, you tear into the author as a bad person. So that's why we felt the need to go out of our way to mention this, is that we are not adding on to those hateful remarks from those jackasses. We're just trying to give an honest critique of the book. So, that aside this book gets so much worse from the first issue because the whole tossing Captain America out of the way um, moment, it garnered a lot of mixed reviews because typically, you know, when you'll do that with another character is when the original character is seen as a little problematic and, you know, fans and writers alike have fought to keep his captain, to keep Captain America as un uh, problematic as they can. So it's just kind of like the TikTok sound. It's like, you did this for what? I mean, for why? What was the reason? But um, the tone just gets so cringy from here on out. Like, it's honestly difficult to describe without, like, visual um, aids. And one of the most controversial moments from the first issue as well is that America runs across Prodigy at the university as well. Love and, you Prodigy. and she greets him in a very bizarre fashion. Travis. Yes. Would you like to read the line? No. Is it the one I think it is? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah it's just the one you think. <laughs> You've been waiting like half an hour, Travis. You might as well just get it over with. I have been waiting like a half an hour. 
<laughs> it's so bad. Prodigy, what the holy menstruation are you doing here? I'm not touching this with a 10 foot pole. I'm not doing it. It's, it, it, ain't my, it, it ain't my it ain't my fight. It ain't my fight. Like I'm like I'm, it's not my it's not my court. It's not my it's not my my, my field. And this is, I I am not no. Like I, I will, I will take, I, I will take my like, 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 like my gay jokes elsewhere and have fun with the gay jokes. But Mary, this is your ball. You, you, you get to critique this, this one. Is, this is your, this for, is your for ball. For me, I'm, I'm gonna just, I'm just throw this out there. For me, this is like the lady equivalent of like, I don't know. Let me just replace words with weird. What people think women are into? Prodigy. What the holy fried chicken are you doing here? Oh. Like that. <laughs> Am I allowed to laugh at this? Yes. Yes. <laughs> like, 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 like I, I, it, it, it ain't my ball. It ain't my, like because if I step at this, if I, if I step on this court, I, I'm gonna step out of line. It's not for me to speak on, Mary. This is your ball. If, if, like, oh yeah, I'm gonna. I'm not gonna lie, bro. Like if I say anything about this, I'm gonna get myself <laughs> fucked up because I'm right. not intelligent enough to talk about it, and it's so far out of my lane that I'm gonna that's, get caught slipping. Right. That's why. <laughs> that's, why, that's, why I, that's why I stepped back earlier and like like it cut myself <laughs> off. Like if this was some black shit, you know, me and Travis would be all over it. But I'm not doing it. This, this is your ball, Barry. How you feel about that line? I'm laughing so hard I'm crying. <laughs> I, I, it's, not, it's not my ball. I'm not doing it. I love that the two, both of you just dove away from this like it's a live grenade. <laughs> like, it is a live grenade. Like, 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 I, like, I feel like Huey and Mother's Milk at, at the fucking uh, the boys fight where they're just beating the shit out of fucking... Um, at a, at a uh, what's her face at, at a storm front, and you're just like, like, like we're not gonna be like Frenchie and say, oh, girls do do it better. Like, nah, we're not just gonna, we're, not, we're just not gonna say shit. We're just gonna let it happen. Shit, you Nazi bitch. Right. Like, 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 like we're not, we're, we're just not gonna say shit. Like, I, I, like me and Travis are Huey and Mother's Milk right now. We're not saying shit. You, you do that. You have fun. Like, we ain't about that. I just want my doll's house to be in order. That's all I care about right now. <laughs> Okay, so the line holy menstruation, what are you doing here? Shot through Twitter like wildfire. And I find Twitter has replaced 2014 Tumblr as the garbage heap of the internet. Everybody on that bird app hates the fucking bird app. So needless to say, this did not go unnoticed. And it shot around both, you know, comic skate and anti comic skate narratives like wildfire of, oh my God, what is this? Now, first of all, you know, it, it, it's obviously, I, I feel like it's more of a nod to like the leaping lizards, Batman. Like, that's the way that line sounds to me. It's not like a holy shit, dude, what are you doing here? It's leaping lizards, Batman. Look who's here. Right. And that's how the line reads. But I mean, and it also sounds like a turfy thing to say. It really does. Because like rad fans are obsessed with periods. Like, I, I, you know, some will call it like, you know, the divine passage or the sacred passage or the passion passage that gives life. Like, but like they're obsessed with their periods. Okay, so Mary, um, I have a really stupid cisgendered male question to ask you. Shoot, bro, wouldn't Travis. that wouldn't that like the 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 holy menstruation imply that menopause is something evil? Uh, no, no, no. Tra- I mean, if you ask my if you ask my mother, I'm sure she'd say menopause is evil. <laughs> uh, Sorry, mom. I know you listen sometimes. But I couldn't begin to tell you because the rad femme ideology falls apart so quickly. So, <laughs> like, I, I think because, you know, some rad femmes will kind of cross over into the goddess worship thing. And so you'll have, like, the maid, the mother, and the crone kind of a thing. So it's just kind of nonsense. I wouldn't pick too part into it because it'll just crumble apart in your hands. 
Fair. Okay. So, and Gabby Rivera very much is not a, a turf. No, I am not implying no. that at all. No, she does not come off like a turf whatsoever. No, no. Oh, oh, God, no. She, you know, is an active um, voice online in uh, decrying transphobia. So, I, I mean, you know, she's also touched on it in her own books. Like, you know, so we are not saying this, like, again, these are not personal critiques toward the writer. This is just the one way I read this line is that holy menstruation is kind of something it sounds like a turf would say. And I did pick up a bit of a man hating narrative in the book. So, I. Uh, I don't know if that was implied or if I was just reading into it, but pretty much all men are stupid and bad. Wow. <laughs> Travis, why do you think I'm over here, like, making memes and not touching this to the 10-foot <laughs> pole? Like, I'm it's literally... just, I, I hear the things that Mary's saying, and I just think of, like, Hotep shit immediately. <laughs> right, like, like, yeah. Unfortunately. Grand rising. <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't drink much aside from the occasional whiskey or scotch. So this plus that edible and I have, you know, I live in Indiana. There's nothing here. Um, So I keep losing my train of thought. So if I'm rambling, I've kind of lost my train of thought for a bit. I think we've, we've, we've covered um, Gabby pretty well. Um, let, oh, let's... no. No, we did not. We have not gotten to space the mascara bullshit. Damn it. I was trying uh -uh, to say okay. uh -uh. no, you you made the sure third I bullet point. Back. You made sure I came back to this point. We're not getting away without talking about space that mascara and magical procreative lesbian space sex. I'm just, I'm just, what? Okay. So Gabby Rivera decides to expand on America's origin a bit. And I can safely say this is the point where the book completely falls apart. Because the rest of the book, you are so in shock of what you just witnessed that everything else just kind of falls away. And honestly, let me be clear, nobody liked this book. You know, we all try to kind of like forgive it at the start for, you know, it's coming across a little cringy and it's, you know, clumsy handling of sensitive political topics. Like you're getting so. your feet wet. People make mistakes, but like, ugh. But it's when we address America's origin that it starts to fall apart. Um, again, you know, we're going to go back and we're going to touch on she's from the utopian parallel. You know, that's outside the multiverse. She cannot go back. So this is where we're at with that concept. Um, America runs across one of her grandmothers. I believe she's Amalia's mother because America's parents are Amalia and Elena Chavez. So I believe the grandmother is Amalia's mother. And she's also kind of a professional wrestler. It doesn't make sense to me either. But she is also outside the parallel. And, you know, everyone's kind of like, what's going on here? And through a series of plot reasons that I don't want to get to her, we'd be here all night. Um... We get to find out more about America's life, or America gets to find out more about it. So the grandmother starts to walk her through slowly, and that's where we get the establishing shots of the utopian parallel. I want to pull up um, the issue, um, because it, I think it might be easier to explain um, what's happening visually. And, like, honestly, the thing that gets me about this is that for they got Jen Bartell to do some of the interiors. And that woman's work with color is god tier. So, like, the scene with the magical lesbian space goddesses, like, it's beautiful. But I don't know. It just gets weird. So they go to the ancestral plane where... Again, some mystical magic universe that you know. And here we get the creation of the planet, I believe. Yeah. Basically, the two goddesses that created the planet end up 
getting into it like some lesbian shit and they swirl around each other and boop a planet is made so they're lesbian space goddesses who created the planet um yeah yeah. (laughs) um so there's that all right so the worst book Okay, and then we get to the Utopian Parallel, finally. It's where America's grandmother and Amalia have to, you know, have to flee to. And the Utopian Parallel is populated entirely by women. That, you know, it, it, it's the Mascara, basically. And, um... It previously was not, or we did not know it was, because Gillen didn't lay any of it down. So we don't know if it was originally Space the Mascara or if she just made it Space the Mascara. I'm going to say she just made it Space the Mascara. And honestly, you know, all women's societies, that's pretty standard. Comic fans aren't unused to seeing that. But... It just, again, it comes across as very cringy. And we see America's parents grow up together because they met very young. And then they decide to get married and have a baby. But more lesbian magic space X, honestly, is that, you know, America's birthed through a star imprinted on Elena's stomach. And like, yeah. It's not my ball. It's not my ball. There's no way I'm I'm dying out here. It's not my it's not my ball, man. I I uh yeah, man. I'm not trying to crucify myself. I'm sorry, Mary. Like, like I'll I'll help you with Made in America, but this ain't my ball. This ain't my ball. Like, because Made in America, the I more have you a, explain I, I it, the concern. less I can say shit. Right, like. <laughs> Cause now, now you've dove off the pot of like, like, like women, like, like, like you know, very much. You continue down the women reproductive rabbit hole more so than we can touch, and it's just gotten like the pole has just gotten longer, and it's heartbreaking because I want to fish you out with the longest fishing pole possible, but I ain't got nothing for you till we get to Made in America. Anyway. <laughs> So, the abyss the abyss gazes back. <laughs> so within all women's society, it's obviously very heavily implied that America Chavez is the biological daughter of both Amalia and Elena. So again, even in comics, that's not super weird because um Connor Kent, the internet can kiss my ass. He has gay dads. Yes, he does. Yes, so, he, yeah. Absolutely. He's the clone of Superman and Lex Luthor, if you didn't know. Oh, yeah, there was a great line in uh, the, the newest Young Justice episode where um, McGann says that um, Jonathan and Martha and Clark gave their permission for them to get married. And then Beast Boy goes, what about Lex Luthor? And they just smack him across the room. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. But uh, again, so that, again, that's not super weird to see. It just, after Magical Lesbian SpaceX, this is kind of just like, what is this? Now let's just erase all of that from canon. Forget all of that. Doesn't matter. All of it's gone. James? What? We're not done. We're not done? (laughs) No, but I'm gonna let us be done. Anyway, um, fast forward to 2021. Let's erase all of that from canon. I'm gonna let Mary have a break. Because Made in America is where I get pissy. So, I was really yeah, excited. About- everything, we've, everything we've talked about, the utopian parallel outside the multiverse, uh, the entire plot of Young Justice Volume 2. Like, literally think of it like the South Park meme. And it's gone. And it's gone. Like, like literally, it's just gone. Like, everything. Because with the uh, release of America, Ch- America Chavez Made in America... We saw the retconning of everything because now, over the course of five issues, or made in the USA, I apologize. Um, like we we see Kalinda Vasquez very much go through and just say, "Hey, 
what if you were what if you're just repressing all of these memories with some fantasy shit and we're just like wait what what what, what? no 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 because let's be real it was kind of pushing it to, to do the whole like space lesbian themiscara let's reproduce asexually somehow like it, it, it it's a reach and for like and like for comic books we we've heard weirder like 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 seriously we've heard weirder but when it came to this i'd had it i was like yo because like i straight up like i heard about this i read it and then i said i'm not doing it again then i reread it for today and i'm just like why so what am i talking about so over the course of five issues um kalinda Vas- vasquez goes through and starts to have america be back i believe in in, in like in, in new york and she's um, like visiting her adopted family and trying to basically cope with the fact that she does not share the same name as them, that she like washed up on shore, like sort like sort of how like, like, like Moses did, and her like her adopted family just found her in a space suit and took her in and brought her home. But then you start seeing like alienation from her family that like oh she starts drawing pictures of like her real moms and that like she doesn't have a dad but she has two moms from space and then at like slowly as the book progresses you see her losing her powers for whatever reason her powers start to just fail her at random times and then she meets up with spider-man peter parker for like five minutes and does some cool shit but then you see her uh, de- like, like start to argue with her adopted family about not belonging and feeling really bad about that, which can be hard, something very hard. I deal with that a lot of the time, like being from, like, like biracial and having yeah, from two different worlds all the time. But then you see this random hooded figure start stalking America, and you, you then have her follow uh, that person and find out, oh, America has a long lost sister. And then you find out, oh no. America and her long lost sister were just experimented on by a white man and uh, her two moms, and uh, who may or may not actually be her, their moms. Uh, no, because- um, external sources does um, say that America's birth mother is Amalia. Okay, because like the book really wasn't clear about that, and it pissed me off. So I'm yeah, glad no, it, it, that. it's very clear that they were taken for a ruse, taken for a okay. ride. They actually okay, end cool. up blowing up the, sacrificing themselves and blowing up the facility. Right. Like, they go through the effort, like, because like, apparently there was just these hundreds of, like, little girls that were being tested on and were being experimented on. And then, like, in a, in a crazy freak way, her, her mothers decide to, like, like, basically, like, blow up the whole joint and get rid of the experiments from this crazy white man. And then what ends up happening is as the revolt, the revolution against the white man starts to go down... And they try to delete the experimental like realms and worlds they were creating. America opens a portal and ends up falling through it and washing up on shore, repressing all of those memories and just believing for all this time that she was from a different universe. And <sighs> like you, you you literally get to the end of the book and you you get to the end of the book and she sort of just like gets that resolution of it's okay I I, I I still have my real family because like there's this whole thing where her sister like like feels in her bones that her mothers are still alive so she makes America open a portal for her and then the, the portal ends up being some random distant dimension that has no ties to anything so the, the sister falls through and dies. And then, and, and then America just kind of goes, oh, well, I have my real family. And you're just like, what the fuck? Like, you, you, you really sit there and just go, like, this, this is worse than just, like, Gabby diving off the, uh, off the pyre and just saying, I'm going to make weird space lesbians. This is, we're just going to erase everything. And, and, here, and my theory in regards to this is they wanted to ground America that way she's somewhat relatable for when they finally do bring her into the MCU. Which, the, the, Disney, di, 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 Disney, we are in a time period where you're trying to inhumify the Eternals. You, you, you have a universe where a talking raccoon had a conversation with Robert Downey Jr. and helped him build a giant time machine. 
Like, we're past the point of relatability or believability. You can have a universe where a girl has two moms from a weird utopia thing. Like, we're past this. So, I just, I, I look at this book and think, wow, you had another shot. And, you, and rather than rising from the mistakes of the past, you just burnt it all down. What in God's name? And I just, I really hate that I'm critiquing this. Because, like, I, I still want to just throw this back to Mary, but this ain't my ball. Because I don't like having to critique books that I wish would succeed and I want to succeed because they're diverse and it's what we need. But when they're just so bad that you look at it like, why? I can't help it. So it I'm also, just, yeah. It also doesn't help that this retcon throws a lot into chaos. First of all, it completely invalidates the entire plot of Young Justice, vol of, Young, of Young Avengers Volume 2. And it hits at one very, very important part of America's character that we didn't get to, is that prior to this, she was from the utopian parallel, outside the multiverse, which meant one thing. America Chavez has no multiverse counterparts. She is the only one in the entire multiverse because she doesn't come from it. So, you know, in all of her dimension hopping, she's never run across another version of herself because it's just her. Whereas she knows multiple versions of the same people and routinely will spend time with them. Um, you, no one else has any exposure to her within that. I've lost my train of thought again. But if America is, you know, just a human that had a disease and now has these powers, as a result of experimentation that opens her up that okay she is from the multiverse she is from 616 this is going to be a problem going forward that a lot of her special involvement has consisted of her being the only one so what's going to happen now this is going to be a huge problem that other writers in the future may have to address it like and it might have to result in another retcon that this was a trauma response to a different trauma response we're, we're straight up just done a troy this poor girl and it's just like do we have to just make every like dope ass like woman of like with stars on just be like have no like origin that makes sense so and it's like i wanted this to be a dissection and a rant be specifically because of the fact that america chavez has so much potential she can be this light, this inspiration to so many, like Gabby Rivera said in her TED Talk, that can be something for so many people. But when it's just done so poorly, it's like the, the main rant that I have with, um, and when it comes to black books, where we're supposed to just accept the representation regardless of if it's bad, and if we don't like it, we don't get any more. That has to stop. So... I wanted to do this episode specifically to not only highlight the amazing work that Karen Gillan and Al Ewing did with these with this character, but also to give hope that we can learn from these mistakes and potentially give um, America a better future here. Because like her, like, like, like the thumbnail that we're using for this episode is the her Philomena's cover, uh, her Philomena's cover, Philomena's cover from um, the Marvel Voices uh, Pride Month uh, covers. And it's gorgeous. And originally, I thought about being problematic and doing an Iceman episode, but I, I don't have the patience to be problematic right now. Problematic? Well, well we're already being problematic. But like, in terms of, I, I, don't, I don't feel... I, I'd rather dissect poor representation instead of just possibly really psychologically damning representation. So I didn't want to touch that tree. But in, ter in terms of this, it very much feels like this can be something really good to learn from. So, I, 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 Mary, I'm sorry that you went through the pain of having to, like, talk about this. There's, a, there's yeah. one other point that I want to make just about the book itself. Go for it. Is that, unfortunately, it's not, like, it's not one of those books that it's so bad it's good. It's, you have to experience the train wreck for yourself bad. Art's really good, and it kind of, like, makes you think this could be a really good book, and then you're just like, what the fuck is happening? And the the only time that the book actually gets any kind of a solid 
narrative is the two ish issues I think of the book where Kelly Thompson came in to help, right? Because it was a Kate Bishop crossover. Mm-hmm. The first issue kind of like had a lot of had a lot of Kate involved with it, and this might help explain kind of the cringiness of the political tone. Is that in that crossover, America meets up with a prospective romantic partner. Again, this takes place before her girlfriend in West Coast Avengers. And Kate Bishop had driven her there. And she's watching the two get very cuddly and very romantic. And eventually they fly off to talk. And Kate Bishop gives this very bizarre monologue about how wonderful lesbians, women, love sapphics are. That, you know, it must be wonderful to, like, be able to love another woman. And she's like, I have to deal with stupid men, yada, yada, yada. Like, it's just a very bizarre line to deliver, talking about, like, the beauty of sapphic love kind of a thing, and that she's jealous. Um, Can we talk talk about it? Like, it's just, that's the kind of cringy tone that the political subplot tries to take, and it's part of what made the book kind of hard to look at. So that's just the last point I really wanted to make on it is that it's none of it's very good. Eric, can we talk about it? What? Can we talk about it? Yeah, go for it. Like, we, can we talk about the Jeremy thing? Oh, yeah, no, 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 no. He made that public. Thank God. Okay, so Jeremy Whitley loved, this man, loved this man to death. He had originally pitched the idea of, like, America-Kate becoming canon. And it's like, why couldn't you just let the man write it? It was so he good. Did, he did write it. I've seen the he, script. He, he, so have I. Like, he did write it, but, like, why couldn't you make it canon? Why and it was, in, it, it was in the original solicitation. Is Mm -hmm. that, you know, and I remember when that solicitation dropped because it's for the Secret Wars, um, I forget exactly what the book was, but, you know, it it ends in this um, side story of America bouncing between universes. At least I think that's where the book would have been, unless it was, yeah, whatever. But um, it would have been America bouncing around to different universes. And like I said, you know, she knows multiple versions of the same people. So... Um, she was going to team up with Kate Bishop. And um, it was more or less going to have a moment where the two share a kiss. I don't want to, you know, get too far into it. But it was essentially going to, and I, you know, make America Kate canon. So a lot of us saw that and the solicitation said, Kate uh, Bishop and America Chavez find love in a deserted world or something like that. And fans got very excited very quickly. And then all of a sudden, poof, it wasn't in uh, the final cut of the book. And that solicitation, that first solicitation, was very quickly taken down. It's gone. But um, Jeremy has said that they didn't cut it because it was gay. It just kind of got cut in editing. And I'll I'll take his word at that. You know, that's the conversation between him and the people at Marvel. But... um, I jokingly asked him about it one time, and then a little bit later, he actually just went ahead and made public. And it's like a two, three page story, but it ended up kind of becoming this legendary underground moment. Why can't it just be canon? And like I said, America, it's a very popular fanship, but a lot of writers don't seem to want to cross that line with Kate Bishop. How dare and, and honestly, I feel like it would just make sense for Kate Bishop to be by. Yeah. All right, folks. So that uh, I feel like we've petrified Travis. So we're going to go ahead and wrap up this episode. Don't forget that you can listen to this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher Radio, Spotify, YouTube, Audible, Amazon Music, Spot, uh, Pandora, wherever you can get a, a podcast, um, except for SoundCloud, you can find us. So please tune in and watch us do stupid shit. If you want to check out our last episode we did, where we had um, Anton Comics on to talk about DC Fandom, that was well a two-hour episode, but it was a fun episode to record. Dude, so I had so much fun. We have to see if we can get Anne back. Oh, most definitely. So, like, if you definitely want to tune into that episode, you can find it like as the previous episode, episode 65. But, um, I... 
I'm really excited for next week because I have been prepping for this. It mean this this uh, next week is gonna mean a lot to me, and I'm going to literally go over the moon and back again trying to get um friggin' Mark Russell to see next week's episode. I'm going to do everything in my power to make sure that man sees next episode. Because next week, we will be talking about the um, DC Comics, Hanna-Barbera, um, cro- okay. like, uh, book, what, Jesus, man. Um, the DC Comics, Hanna-Barbera, a book written by Mark, Rus- uh, R- Mark Russell, that literally, this is how special this book, this book means to me, and I kid you not. When I was struggling coming out for the first time as gay, Mary sent me this book. And it meant the it- world. It meant the world to me. So when I tell you that I, next week's going to be fucking awesome, and honestly, I keep thinking we're getting a tattoo about it. So get ready for James cries for an, how, about an hour and a half talking about uh, the, the Snagglepuss. I can't talk. Fucking the Snagglepuss. Right, the Snagglepuss Chronicles. Because this book is going to be a hell of a ride. So get ready. Um, Travis, or uh, hopefully you're not dead. What is your closing statement for the episode 66 of Panel to Panel? Oh God, he's dead. I think I put him to sleep with my inebriated mumblings. Travis, Travis, wake up! Shit, he's dead. All right, I guess. Well, I guess Travis is dead, or he had an emergency. So we, <laughs> Mary, what is your closing statement for this episode of Panel to Panel? mercy um i shouldn't get this intoxicated before we record because i'm genuinely terrified to listen to this back it wasn't that bad i only had one beer so we were fine um and my closing statement as always is next week i'm probably gonna cry um as always james uh, can do the prep research oh no I, i've already started the fuck yeah um, i'm gonna wake off <laughs> Anyway, um, my closing statement, as always, is support your local comic book shop. As I always say, folks, even if you don't like picking up um, the physicals, I know there's a lot of people, and I found a lot more people than I thought of uh, trade weight, because a lot of people were trade waiting waiting for this week's release of Far Sector. Um, Even if you trade weight, even if you wait to purchase a trade, your comic book shop will pre-order a trade for you. Your comic book shop can still benefit from you uh, getting their comic Comicsology affiliate link for uh, trades. Please support your local comic book shop. They're still going to be around for a little bit longer, so please support them. It means a lot. Like, yeah, not every comic book shop is the best. Some can be gatekeepy, some can suck. But if you find a good one and you want to support it, please do, because they mean a lot. And uh, next week I'm probably going to cry. And uh, apparently Travis is dead. So we will go ahead and see if we can gather the Dragon Balls and pick up Travis. And we will catch you folks next time right here at Panel to Panel. Peace.